We're going to read from Mark's Gospel today, where we are starting a new series, looking at some of the the passages from from Mark's Gospel. And uh, today we're going to look at Mark chapter 11, and it's the Palm Sunday uh, happenings, that very first Palm Sunday, page 1015. And let's hear God's word. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it, Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven! Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He he looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. We pray that the Lord would add his blessing upon his truth. Amen. I don't know if many of you have been watching the latest uh, police, not documentary, but um, crime uh, program. Obviously, I haven't watched it. I think it's called Blue Lights. Is that? There are some people who know what I'm talking about. So if you've been, this is the new line of duty thing, and some people think it's wonderful and they've been watching it avidly. Um, I did notice one little detail on the news last week, what they were saying about it, is that towards the end of episode one, there's a mistake. Have you watched it, Tom? Episode one? Okay, episode one. Did you notice at the end of episode one, Someone stops to give someone a lift. A, an Audi pulls up to offer that lift. And then what, the next scene, they're in the car. It's now a Skoda. <laughs> and as the car drives away, it's an Audi again. Rewatch it. Okay. Uh, the most famous incident like that as well, there's another one uh, in Tom Cruise's film, Days of Thunder. And again, you can rewatch this one. He has a very unusual injury. Uh, because at one point he's got a, a, a red mark on this eye, then later on in the movie it's now moved to this side, and then later on in the movie again it goes back to this, this eye. Uh, so those blooper type things, as they're called, are more common than we would think. And I wonder, looking at the incident, the, the story of Palm Sunday, that whether the early disciples who were with Jesus, because they had an expectation of how they thought this was all going to transpire for them, that whether they thought they were in the middle of something like like that because the script wasn't being followed in the way that they had the expectation of it being followed. Yet Jesus himself was following it as he understood it to be, because we will know that it had been laid down by way of prophecy from the Old Testament. And as... Jesus was entering into it. There's another little aspect or little detail of the story that Mark doesn't record, which I think is very useful for us to think about when we turn to Luke's gospel, chapter 19, verse 28, because Luke describes Jesus on his approach into Jerusalem as walking ahead of everybody else. So that Luke has this understanding of Jesus that he's very purposeful, 
He knows exactly what he's doing. He's striding ahead. He knows what he wants to do. There's a definite purpose to what he's doing because that script had been laid down in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is clearly looking forward to this point where now Jesus is in the midst of and in the middle of Jerusalem, because it was predicted that the final moments of what the Messiah was doing, the, the culmination of the, the salvation that he would, he would bring would center on the city of David. So ever since the beginning of Eden, we might say, that this salvation that God was bringing was moving to this definite point, and it was going to be at the time of Passover. The Passover was the, the weekly reminder that the Jewish people had whereby they th remembered the sacrifice of the Passover lamb, that lamb that had shed its life, given its life, shed its blood as a picture of the salvation that God would bring when the angel passed over the people in Egypt. And so Jesus was now putting himself into that picture as this was now happening at Passover time and that he was saying, I am now the culmination, the final Passover lamb. And another Old Testament prophecy looking forward to this, and you're again, I'm sure you're very familiar with this, is Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, written 500 years before the moments that we're now here reading about. And what it says is that, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So Palm Sunday, it's all about welcoming Jesus. And if I guess we understand that, we get what Palm Sunday is really about. So I'm going to look at this passage in Mark's gospel and maybe think of some relatively simple ways in which we see Jesus being welcomed here in the story that might apply uh, in our lives as well. And maybe the first one is simply that we can welcome Jesus by obeying him. And I see that's what, these, what the disciples of Jesus were certainly doing, even though it may have seemed somewhat unusual to them. Read with me in verses 2 and 3 of uh, the Mark, Mark chapter 11. The instructions that Jesus gave... Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. And then verses 4 to 6 describe what actually happened. It says they went and they found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. And as they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? And they answered, as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. So Jesus actually spells out exactly what was going to happen, and it happened just exactly as Jesus had said, which was, of course, quite remarkable, quite astounding. I'm sure the disciples were taken aback at that. But let's try and maybe try and understand in a way, if you had been in there in those moments, what this was actually like, to try and think that a donkey may not seem terribly significant to us. Back in the day, it would have been reasonably expensive. So you're thinking, let's imagine a, a nice, shiny, red convertible Porsche sitting outside someone's house. Someone comes up, jumps into the front seat, it's about to take it away. Someone steps outside, hey guys, what are you doing? And then all you have to say is, the Lord needs it. Oh, that's all right. Just go on ahead. Now, that's the sort of significance of what's actually happening here, maybe in our terms. Now, donkeys are nice. But what we need to say that what a donkey is, even back then, is that a donkey is not a, donkey is not a war horse. A donkey is not coming with a chariot fit for a soldier behind. It's a simple, plain donkey. And the reason that that is significant is, of course, the people of Israel would have been looking forward in what 
the Messiah was going to do is that the Messiah was going to come and vanquish the enemy. So they were expecting a soldier. They were expecting a leader. They were expecting someone who would come and deliver them. So not so much a donkey or not so much just a, a simple animal like this, but they were expecting a, a soldier who would lead them out, fit of a war horse more so. So in our context, we're thinking that what Jesus is getting in is like a bright red convertible Porsche. It's not an Apache helicopter. So that's the understanding with which we come to this. So they're looking for deliverance. They're looking for salvation. And the one that they have is Jesus and he comes on a donkey. So whatever the, the, these disciples were thinking, astounded as they might be, that it was actually transpiring in the way that Jesus had spoken. It was still a bit of a disappointment, but still they obeyed exactly as Jesus said. They did what Jesus told them to do. And that thought always challenges me. I'm sure it challenges you. And that one way, one simple way that we can welcome Jesus is by obeying him. Whenever we read the Bible, whenever we understand what it is that God is saying to us, that the first thing that we do is that we should respond to that, even when it may be difficult, even when it may be challenging, even when it may cause a bit of upset in our own lives and our own experience, that actually we should obey that even when it is costly. And so one of the ways in which we can obey, uh, we can welcome Jesus is by obeying him. Or another thing that I see simply in this passage is that we can welcome Jesus by honoring him. And that maybe gets to the, to the center of what this passage really is, because verse 8 adds the detail of what is synonymous with us in our thinking about what happened on Palm Sunday. It's the verse 8, if you read it with me, is that many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the field. And then verse 9 adds the other little detail what they were shouting. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which in turn is a quotation from another Old Testament passage, this time Psalm 118. And those verses would have been spoken during the Passover meal. And as the disciples just the night before would have been singing that, I'm sure they are declaring now that Jesus is the King. So there's lots of excitement. There's lots of noise. There's lots of hustle and bustle about Jesus now as he's entering into Jerusalem, as he's making his way purposefully knowing that he is coming to be the one who will be the saviour of the entire world. And amidst all that excitement, Luke also adds another little detail, which Mark doesn't hear. But Luke adds the detail that the religious leaders weren't happy. They weren't happy with the noise. They weren't happy with the people singing the praise of Jesus. And they actually told Jesus Tell your disciples to keep, to keep it down. Tell them to keep quiet. And how Jesus responds to that, if you remember, is that he says, if they keep quiet, the very stones will cry out. So putting all of this together and thinking what's actually happening here on Palm Sunday, you've got a donkey that's never been ridden and is calmly now being ridden by Jesus. You've got Jesus saying that if the people won't speak, the stones will speak. It's not normal stuff. And that Jesus is declaring that he is the king, the one who has come to do something quite remarkable. And the way in which the people now honor Jesus is the way in which they're welcoming Jesus. They are honoring him and giving him the place that he truly deserves. And again, that might challenge us. What estimate do you actually make of Jesus today? Because the nature of that estimate will be the answer to whether or not you are really honoring Jesus. What do you think of Jesus? And so in that sense, have you welcomed him? And when you really welcome Jesus into your life, you will find that Jesus changes you because Jesus speaks to you and that you will be changed through that. 
And if you have understood that, you will know why other believers, other Christians, know that Jesus is someone who is really different and, and is really significant and is really special. When I read the Bible, whether it's New Testament or Old Testament, I find story after story of people who were out of options. People who weren't necessarily looking for religion. They weren't looking for any more rules to follow. But what they did want was that they wanted to find an individual. An individual who could put things right. Who could put the things that were wrong in their lives or their lack of satisfaction, whatever it was, that gnawing sense that was in the midst of their being that they know that things aren't right, but they wanted to know that someone could put that right. Someone who could ultimately forgive them, someone who could ultimately offer them eternal life. And as you read the New Testament, you see that Jesus is that person. And that Jesus spoke to humanity, all men and women, and Jesus speaks to all of us today. And when Jesus speaks and he addresses us today, he says things like, I know who you are, and I know what's going on in your life, and I can understand that, and I understand how you feel. And I can sense your loneliness, and I know the depth of your darkness, and I know even your darkest shame, and Jesus says, I know all of that, but what you need to hear is that Jesus also accepts you as you are, and he offers you forgiveness, and he offers you something completely new and different. And so as I understand how we welcome Jesus, and we think about what that means for us today, we can welcome Jesus by obeying him, yes. We can Welcome Jesus by honoring him, giving him the place that he deserves. And the last point that I have is rather obvious. It's almost embarrassing saying it, but you welcome Jesus by not rejecting him. Because that's the focus of the story after Palm Sunday, isn't it? Because Jesus, Jesus would have known what was ultimately going to happen. And again, I'm going beyond Mark's account. And I'm thinking another event after this morning or afternoon, whenever time of the day Jesus came in. Because Jesus went up the Mount of Olives afterwards. And as he was coming down from the Mount of Olives, he has a view over Jerusalem. And he can see all those whitened, buildings, and perhaps shining in the sun, and particularly the temple itself, which is covered in gold, and it's all reflecting in the sunlight, and it's very obvious, and it's very clear, and Jesus has a sense of that, and that was maybe a sense of wonder of that, but as Jesus comes down, that's not the focus that he has. Because if you remember the account in Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 19, verse 41, it says, As he approached the city, he wept over it. And again, that word wept isn't just like a little tear. Last week, we read the story of Jesus going to Jairus' house in Mark chapter 5. And on, it's the same word, weeping, that was used for Jesus here, weeping over Jerusalem, as was used of the family members in Jairus' house, weeping over the death of a little girl. That's the intensity. And while everybody else on that day was filled with excitement and all that was going on on Palm Sunday, Jesus, at the end of that day, now cries uncontrollably, weeping very loudly. Because what fills Jesus' sense and his mind now is the fact that these people, though they may have welcomed him on entry, he knows that they will very quickly reject him. 
And that doesn't bring Jesus any joy. And it breaks Jesus up. That's the intensity of the emotion that Jesus has in this moment. Utterly amazing that Jesus might still show love to people who reject him. In preparing for this, I was reminded of an interview I'd seen on a, on a video clip from a, a, an American news channel. The event itself happened at a baseball match in 2009, and they were interviewing one of the spectators. And he's, his name was Steve Montforto. He had been watching his favorite game, or his favorite baseball team, which were the, the Phillies. And during that game, there was a foul ball, and the ball was flying up in, into the, the stadium. And he, in those moments, managed to achieve every fan, every real fan's dream, is that he reached over the edge and managed to catch the baseball. And the immediate reaction after that is that you then high-five everybody round and about you because out of all the thousands of the people there, you are the one who actually caught that ball. And that ball is now yours. So this is all being played out, as you would know, on the large screen so that everybody can see what's happening and everybody can see the excitement and everybody's cheering and everybody's excited and he's excited this guy was there with his three-year-old daughter, Emily. And even after all the excitement of having caught that ball, what gives him the most joy is that he then reaches, and it's all been played out on the screen, he reaches the ball to his daughter, Emily, who got the ball and then just turfed it over the edge. <laughs> and everybody round and about gasps. And Emily knew that she had done something very silly, very stupid. And sensing that, and remembering this is all being played out on the big screen, he then just instinctively reaches down and he puts his arms around his daughter and reminds her that he loves his daughter, even though she has just given away a prized possession. And that is a picture of what Jesus does for us. Because we throw him away at times, we reject him, we, we, we ignore what he's saying, we go our own way, we sin, we rebel, we, we, we cast under our feet as nothing the fact that Jesus has died for us. And we forget that and we trample that under our feet and we spurn him. But still Jesus reaches down and he enfolds us with his arms. That is the gospel. And that is what Jesus has done for us. And if we are trying to understand what anything, what Palm Sunday is about, it is about welcoming Jesus. And it's about understanding that, yes, Lord Jesus, I have done the wrong thing. I have gone my own way. And perhaps you will recognize that today, that that's, that's you. I've done that. That's, that, that's in, your, in your mind so much so that you begin to even wonder, will Jesus really still forgive me and offer me his love? But he does because He's the saviour of the world who reaches out to us and offers us that start again. That's what Palm Sunday is about, and that's how we welcome Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we are the sinners. We are the rebellious ones who go our own way, do our own thing. Lord, meet us afresh. Come face to face with us in this place today. May we not be able to walk out from our seat 
without knowing that we welcome Jesus because we need Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that your sacrifice for us is full, complete, and it covers our sin, our failure, feelings and failures completely. So, Lord, as you reach out to us, we reach out to you. But we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the one who takes hold of us. Lord, we meet Jesus here in this place. And Lord, continue with us. Cleanse us, forgive us, and hold us. And we pray in your name. Amen.